educational programs this year. Um, so grant, grants are a part of my purview, which is why we are together today. Um, if I could have everybody introduce themselves real quick, that would be very helpful for me. Dr. Cartier, would you mind again? Patricia Cartier, Secondary School Programs here at Central Office. Chris, do a row of all things. Oh, yeah, you're all part of this. Yeah, Chris Rotolo, uh, Technology Communications Assistant, uh, here to observe and record. <laughs> I'm Heather Stafford, I'm here at Bayshore, and um, I'm the co-leader of MTF Lodeo. Holly Rolf, I'm the rep, one of the reps for Thompson, and I have kids at Blue Croft here. Uh, Rachel Kanapka, the other rep for Thompson, and I have two at South. I'm um, Amy Waltz, and I'm the rep for Leonardo, and I have a son at Bayshore. Margaret Leori, and the, one of the two reps for Nuts on. Great. Jennifer Boris, um, the other rep for Hi, John Kerrigan, Director of Evaluation and Assessment. Uh, Jessica Alphone, sorry for the voice, um, Assistant Superintendent, uh, Curriculum Instruction and Special Services. All right, how many of you already participated with the PAC portion of this last year? Perfect. So we have at least some of you are kind of familiar with, with what we're doing. Um, I believe that we changed the format a little bit with our like rotation of meetings, um, but what we, you know, have Oh, that's the wrong name, isn't it? This is the Parent Advisory Council. Does that change that? Um, so what we are doing is alternating. <laughs> um, so we'll go pick and pack, pick and yak, um, alternating kind of throughout the year so that we can address some of those concerns that we need to and, and those important issues that are coming up throughout the year, but also uh, you know, kind of keep us focused on how we are addressing our use of grant funds, which is the Parent Advisory Council actually has to happen as per federal statute. When we receive these funds, we agree to also make sure that we have this sort of a format with parents involved, that we are getting um, stakeholder input from everybody, um, and that we are spending our grant money in um, responsible ways. So the purpose of our Parent Advisory Council is to provide input and feedback from you to us um, how to spend those federal grant monies. Um, we will conduct another needs assessment towards the middle to end of the year. Um, we will talk about if we need any things like amendments uh, needed to grants. Even this year, we, you know, we could go back and forth on those things, but really it's to talk about what our future programs will be like. Um, and then also one of the one of the um, one of the buckets of money that we get for our title funds is parent engagement ideas. So we're always looking and different ways to do parent engagement when it comes to um, our, specifically our Title I schools. Um, and we could also do other events. All right, so our the overview of our needs assessment cycle, what's interesting is that we are currently like in the middle of it, so we have to start here and then work our way backwards uh, because right now we already have our grant funds for this year, right? So we've already done the planning for it. We've identified the needs. We have come up with ways to spend it, and now that we're here, Cool. now we are spending it. So now we are spending our grant money, supporting our students and our programs. Um, so the next couple of months we'll talk about how we're doing that, um, hoping to have some people come in and talk to us about how specifically their programs are run. Um, and then that way we can all kind of examine how we're doing that, reflect on those, and then it'll be very quickly time to start talking about how we're gonna identify our needs for next year. So we'll, we'll send out those surveys again to everybody and then also talk in this group about what are those needs? Um, how are we going to make sure that we are addressing those needs and then make our plans um, and go forward? Um, so that's our, our general cycle. So took some information from last year. So this was our needs assessment results from last April. Um, so you'll see me kind of go back and forth about what the needs assessment said and then Lo and behold, this is how we're spending our money. Um, so when we sent this out, like I said, April, here was approximately our, our breakdown of who responded. Um, and then, like I said, we'll, we'll get into now what we said we wanted to spend money on and then how we're doing it. So the four, four basic title funds that we'll talk about, um, for now at least, are one, two, three, and four. So Title I-A is improving the academic achievement um, and basic programs for all students. Um, Title IIA is supporting effective instruction in the classroom. Three is language instruction for English language learners um, and immigrant students. And then four is 21st century skills. All right, so our Title I-A money is, is spent in, or is actually categorized into 
two different ways. We have the targeted assistance model, and we also have a school-wide assistance model. So our, t our Title I funds are designated based on income of our families in our schools. So we have um, an interesting you know, mix each year. There are, uh, the schools kind of come in and out of Title I funding. So what's interesting this year is that Leonardo didn't actually, it was Leonardo, Qualify, but because they had received money last year, we were able to continue funding Leonardo's programs this year. So luckily, we have a little bit of leeway, even if a school doesn't qualify um, to do that. And then North, so we receive a, a certain amount of Title I monies, regardless of how many schools we designate that money to go to. So we have decided as a district, we've gone back and forth on it. I'm sure we'll talk about it again in a couple months. Um, about why we do not fund High School North um, with Title I money. And the, the basic gist is that it's a lot easier with this targeted assistance model to know how we're spending those Title I monies in our students in the K through eight schools. In a high school, it's very, very difficult to target students who meet those criteria and target their needs. So we still receive the exact same amount of Title I money, and now this way we can spend those monies in our K-8 schools and then still have the, the, um, what we need at North, but we don't have to keep track of it so tightly is kind of why it comes down to that. <coughs> Can I ask you a question? Um, it obviously, it's on the red for Leonardo. Sure. What, um, what changed from this year from last year as far um, as to be qualified? So the funds are given based on the percentage of students who meet the low income mm -hmm. threshold. So this year, Leonardo didn't meet that threshold. So we use free and reduced yeah. lunch. Yeah, so we use free and reduced lunch. Yeah. Um, and so it's it's based on how, I don't even know if it's state or federal, but it's, there's so a cutoff every year. So it's people that apply yes. for that? It's so the application should not technically be a yeah. they didn't yeah. yeah. And now we've seen over the last couple of years that with COVID and not, and everybody having free lunch, you know, like having access to lunch, um, our numbers have been a little skewed, but they have a hold harmless where you have the ability to fund for the second year, just in case there is that kind of, um, you know, situation where you're you're right on the border. Right, right. We typically hover with funding schools that have 11 to 13 percent and above as their free and reduced lunch. Mm -hmm. That's kind of where our threshold as a district sits year after year. Yeah, because um, people thought maybe this year was going to be free and it wasn't. And then it's one of the reasons we were pushing those forms so hard yeah, to yeah. make sure that people knew, you know, it's important for us in, in more ways than um, than just getting a, a free and reduced lunch rate. And this is one of those reasons. And most that. of these solidly fall in every year. Yes. It's yes. really our smaller schools that yeah. bounce a little bit um, because of the percentage and the number of kids. And so one or two kids makes a big difference right. when you're talking about numbers. Um, but you know the other buildings, which are a little bit larger, solidly year after year, have a very um, s consistent level of a uh, free and reduced lunch. So we don't want to lose that. We like what we get. I mean, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's a nice there. perk when you need it. But yes, it's um, it's absolutely important to us that those forms come back for that reason. Yeah, um, right. And just so you're aware, the monetary amount that we're designated as a district is based on the census. So like we are designated a monetary amount and it's coinciding with census reporting numbers. Um, and then that lump sum is given to us based on the census and then we see who qualifies based on our free and reduced lunch numbers within the district. And that's based on a formula that comes, boils it down to a per pupil expenditure. Does Spaceshore also go back and forth? No. Or else is it? Not no, often. No, 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 no. They've been in as long as I've been in charge of the grant, which is, uh, I mean, eight plus years. There, yeah, so we'll talk about Bayshore separately, because okay. Bayshore is also getting other money, that's why I didn't include them on this one. Okay. Um, but yeah, Bay, Bayshore has their own thing going on at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and and the, the one thing that's different between the targeted and the school-wide, yeah. is the targeted money has to be spent specifically on the Title I students, the students that qualify as Title I, whereas your school-wide model 
we can t spend it on, uh, you know, including those targeted students, but we can spend it on a, in a more broad way in, in the school. And that's also based on, because they have um, more free and reduced lunch students, we can say that they're a school-wide model. I forget what the percentage is, 30? It's 40 and over, 40, but 40, we apply for a waiver. waiver. So yeah, the, the standard is 40%. So if we had over 40% of our students were receiving free and reduced lunch, then they would be eligible for that school-wide. Um, we're fortunate in that they there was a waiver that we applied for a couple years ago. Um, so now that we received that waiver, Ocean Ave is not at that 40%, close. but they are higher than the rest, and they were close enough yeah. that we could that we could get that. So now with those Title I monies that are appropriated for Ocean Ave, we can put in programs, and again, that's what I'm getting to in a moment, about, you know, that'll, benefit, and arguably everything benefits all of our students, but it's not targeted. So our programs at Ocean Ave are truly school-wide, um, and that we can make sure that everybody benefits, whereas our um, our other Title I schools, we need to make sure that we are meeting those needs and targeting the students who are identified. Um, the waiver also requires you to demonstrate that your programming is producing both. So like there's two layers. One is like you have a, a free or reduced lunch or, or poverty threshold that's you know close to 40. Um, usually they look for anything 50% and higher. And then the second piece is you have to demonstrate through data collection that your targeted program was working for your identified students and that it would benefit the greater good within the building, which is pounding up the leaf. Yeah. Just wondering, with when the form is presented to the parents, sure. um, is it made clear to them, like, fill this out because not only can you get you lunch services and breakfast services for your kid, but also your kid may actually qualify for more, you know, intervention, more educational opportunities because of that. Like, the, the parents realize that, that one gets you the other. And can you almost flip the script and say, if you, if you want to see if you qualify for more services, and P.S., you would also get lunch out of it. Can you do that, or is that, like, not kosher? Well, I think it's a hard thing because not you can't have that conversation in every building, right? Okay. So, like, you, and you also have to be really careful with singling out um, mm -hmm. people that fall into those low socioeconomic bands. So, you know, it, it becomes really, really tricky territory soliciting that way. Okay. Um, you know, I've had people have no idea that that's yeah. what it's based They're on. connected. <laughs> you know, yeah. like I think right. That, right. Right. Yeah. right. And you don't, I just want to clear up one little other piece that you don't automatically get a service because you're free and reduced lunch. What happens is you have to have multiple measures for identification of a student that's in need in some capacity, whether it be academically, behaviorally, social, emotionally. Um, if you have a low-income student who could potentially qualify but does not have concerns, they don't just get yeah, no service. Like, if there have to be other mechanisms. Income cannot be the sole identifier for okay. service. It's based on federal statute. What time of year do people have to submit the uh, free and reduced lunch forms by? Is it over the summer? I, I think it's rolling. They, they can any time. Yeah. Okay. And so often what will happen is, you know, you get your people that have always submitted, right? And then um, the administration, if they notice there's a situation, they very tactfully may say, you know, here's a here's something that you may want to consider. Um, but again, it's it's tricky territory. Yeah. Um, you know, if a kid's coming to school without lunch every day and, you know, that kind of thing, and there is no free and reduced lunch status, the principal might send, like, just a, like, a reminder, like, hey, um, you know, take a look at this. I don't, I'm not sure you're aware of it, et cetera. So when we do our grant applications for, for this purpose, we do them in June. Okay. Um, so we'll, we'll take that snapshot in June, pretty much of everybody who will it out here for that or up until then. Right, but remember, but the yes. qualifier for the amount of money is not the, um, is not those free and reduced lunch forms. That's the census. And then if you are a school that's within the threshold range of, um, you know, where that poverty line falls, and it's based on an average, so um, it, it shifts a little year to year. And you would need quite a few people who are in the reduced status to, get to become that in order to not tip the scales in the little schools. It would basically, like I said, matter the most. Thanks. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So how we're spending our Title I funds, um, and this, so our school-wide programs, just because I'll mention them first, are that we are funding field trips and assemblies um, and some of our professional development consultants, specifically 
directly from the Teachers College Reading and Writers <coughs> Workshop that are coming in this year to work with our teachers and students at Ocean Ave. So those things specifically are our school-wide programs at Ocean Ave. And then in the rest of our Title I buildings, what we um, what we were using the funds for are interventionists, um, so our math interventionists and our reading interventionists, right, our specialists, are who work with our, our students who have identified academic or behavioral needs. As part of the Title I funds, we are, we are obligated but also necessary to also budget for homeless students and neglected students, so we do have those <coughs> available for whenever we need to, to do things like, um, you know, especially instructional supplies. We're able to send things home. Um, our credit recovery, part of that is funded through Title I, um, and then our family engagement program. So if you remember, we have like our literacy nights and our math nights. It's one of the ways that we try to make sure that we bring parents into the education of their children, especially in our Title I buildings, to make sure that they know what we're able to do and what we're doing with their kids. Bridge that gap of school and home. I could just add one more thing. Yeah. I know it's sorry. <laughs> You're listening to this. <laughs> We're trying to let it rest in voice, but it's not gonna happen. <laughs> um, so whenever we talk about federal monies, there's there's a term called supplant versus supplement. Anytime you spend federal funds, you need to be spending over and above what your district budget sets, whatever the level is. So all of these programs and things have to sit over and above what's designated in our operating budget. And you have to be able to demonstrate that. So when we talk about interventionists, um, we talk about funding a portion of their salary that would be over and above what the district would have funded based on their size. So like for instance, if we designate for every 250 kids, we would have an interventionist in a building we need to demonstrate over and above um, you know, what we're funding with title monies. And our interventionists who work in our title schools actually have to justify their time that they're working with title one students, and we have to account for them. So um, it's not so much that we're looking for right, like students who are eligible for it, but they still have to go through that, right? And so they're gonna look at who is identified as academically in need of these intervention services, and then they cross-reference and make sure that we have, you know, that we know who's receiving what services. And do the parents know if their child is eligible and receiving Title I services specifically, or does it not matter? They're just yes. getting what they need as well. Okay. They, they do, and we are required uh, by code to have a Title I family engagement um, information session, which typically happens we try to hold them coinciding to back to school nights or a PFA meeting so that way we get like, that captive audience. Mm -hmm. um, but all Title I schools are required to have that kind of information yeah. session and there's something called a family school compact which parents and, and the school talk about and it, and it kind of frames out what those Title I services would look like. The history of where our needs assessment was, was this was our needs assessment. So when we surveyed the district, um, the, the needs assessment was that we wanted a reduction of student-teacher ratios in our Title I schools, um, and then push in support instruction, and pull out support instruction in those extended day programs. So if you kind of go back to what we had said is how we're funding these things, or you know, the programs that we're funding, um, it's very much in line with, with what we said we needed. Yeah, and the, um, the before and after school, things we have historically we used to take title one money and fund after school and before school kind of learning academies mm -hmm. but the district also <coughs> funds before and after school learning academies and we were finding that um you know that we weren't getting to as many kids as we wanted to because of the fact that um you know it's hard for parents before and after school so we shifted the way we were allocating that money to cover the cost of portions of interventionist salaries so we grow our interventionist kind of team because during the day we have a captive audience. Um, so that was one of the reasons actually going back to North why we didn't fund them. Because when we originally decided to not fund North, we were running this as before and after school learning academies. And we found high school students out of all of our levels are not coming to before and after school learning academies, not the kids that we needed to be there. 
Um, and at the time, when we shifted to funding interventionists, we did not have interventionists at the high school level. We are at that point, and that's why Devin mentioned we're going to start having this conversation again where do we fund a piece now of North's interventionists with this money? Um, so it's just a conversation that we can have now because we're positioned with infusing interventionists at the high school level. But that's kind of the history of why North was not funded with this money particularly. So, and what's nice, if you didn't catch up, is that we're still doing all of those before and after school learning academies at all of our schools, but we don't have to keep such track of who's getting what services. We can offer it to, to anybody. Um, all right, so there's our Title I. Our Title I, A, oh, the, the SIA award, um, grant is specifically what Bayshore is receiving. Um, and they have received it for the last few years. Um, they were identified as having a specific subgroup of students who really needed to be addressed in terms of academic achievement. Um, so we have been uh, working on that. I want to say it's three, if not four years that we've been. Uh, it's been four. It's been four, right? Four, four or five. five. Yeah, it's only supposed to be three. COVID. Right. Yeah, we, we, we keep trying to exit. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's interesting that subgroup because has now gone out of the school. Yes. We don't even have them anymore. I'm not going to be don't it's have a subgroup like that, 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 you know, that meets that point. definition. Not even yeah. a subgroup like that that yeah. has a need. There is just a subgroup. And it wasn't a subgroup that was we would look at and say, like, oh my gosh, they're egregiously underperforming. So part of the identification for this is um, uh, a lower level of assistance. It's not comprehensive support. It's called targeted support. Not to be confused with not to be confused with targeted assistance. But targeted simply means that. In the Title I schools, you had a subgroup that performed in the bottom 5% when compared to all other Title I schools in that subgroup. Yeah. So we had one population, and to be a subgroup, you have to have over 20. So we had just over 20, and they performed in the bottom 5%. But when you looked at their collective performance against kids in the building, they, they were fine. They were average. Mm -hmm. um, so it was kind of like a, a an anomaly, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> just bizarre. So in any event, it's the gift that keeps on giving. We started at about $60,000 as the first award, and then it dwindled over time because I think truly the state probably under budgeted for a massive undertaking like this because if they're giving us sixty grand for 20 kids, imagine what they're giving places that had lots and lots of needs. Um, we should exit will most likely happen for us this year because we don't have enough to even have a subgroup in that population anymore and um, this is now five years. Um, so, you know, I, I think this will be the last year of this money, which is when we will then reabsorb Bayshore back into the Title I loop because they're getting other funds. You know, it's just easier to keep track of. And SIA money you can use for any student in your building. Does it not have to be the targeted subgroup? Oh, yeah. So again, funding part of the intervention of salaries just seemed to make sense. Okay. So we're, we're able to use that a little easier even yeah. um, for that. Is that unusual that they sure being that so there's four elementary schools, three of them are Title I schools, that they sure wouldn't be considered Title I. So the only one is now the same, right? No, it is Title I. It is Title I. We just didn't fund them this year because they were getting SIA money. money. Oh, okay. But so wouldn't that be, oh, so Bayshore, oh, so Bayshore, Bayshore, Bayshore is this so Monday, the so money they'll get. Because so again, like we get that amount of money regardless of who we designate as a Title I a receiving school. So because we knew that we had these funds specifically for Bayshore and we could fund the interventionist salaries, it made more sense to defray the cost of interventionists in other buildings based on the Title I funds that we were getting. So but now that we are funding is all a shell. It's, it's yeah. all a shell. It's like a shuffling. Yeah, it is. Yes. But on paper, yes. and we have to figure out how yep. to. On paper, oh you have to justify that you're over and above of what your district would spend. Mm -hmm. So people that use our federal money smartly craft their district operating budget with federal funds in mind. Yeah. Yeah. So that way, you have abilities to justify spending. Mm -hmm. The language changed a few years ago. Supplement and supplant used to be something completely different in the sense of you could not put in a program that you were using district monies for with Title I. So I'll give you a tangible example. We put in foundations eight years ago, nine years ago. Foundations, we started out defraying the cost through Title I monies. Because we were using Title I monies to defray the cost in those buildings, we could not put it in the other buildings. 
because it was a programmatic supplementation and supplant language. They erased that probably three or four years ago and it became monetarily driven. So the supplement and supplant language went away from programming because it was definitely handcuffing everybody to now it was just, you have to demonstrate that you're spending more. And you wouldn't be able to afford it if you didn't have the money. So, so yeah, we'll, we'll throw Bayshore back in the bucket yeah. <laughs> once they're exited and then we'll figure out how all of it um, you know, plays out. But we plan to keep supporting these interventions however we can. I should know this. Is this federal money from yes. the national government that the state is the one who determines how much we get? State has this no involvement. Well, this is federal. This is entirely federal. federal. So when we yeah. talk at board meetings about state aid coming down, blah, this blah, is federal this money. Is federal money. Yeah. Of money. So okay. what ends up happening is the state has to apply for ESCA funds, okay. which is the federal funds. And there are certain compliance features that the state holds. Um, when we talk about all those ESEA accountability features, it's test scores, attendance rates, all of those other pieces. Um, so every year the state, every, the state every year to the federal government has to submit a grant, or a grant, they call it a grant. It's really an application okay. for federal funds outlining how they will meet those accountability statistics. So when people talk about like, if the state doesn't do X, Y, and Z, they won't qualify for federal funds. That's what that means. So. Another tangible example, when state testing, you know, was a big hot button issue during COVID, we have to have state testing, Start Strong came about. It's because in the federal grant money application, we said we were gonna have a, a, an assessment. So we New Jersey. Correct. We New Jersey. We framed out our application and said we're gonna have um, an assessment in grades three to whatever. We're gonna do this as our marker for um, student success with attendance. And because we were bound by those features to the federal government because of the monetary tie to it, the state had to come up with something and the, they applied for a waiver, which was the Start Strong. So we won't do a spring assessment, but we'll do something in the fall to meet the requirement of the grant application for federal funding, which is this money. Okay, so the state applies to get a bucket of money for the entire state and then we try to get a sliver of that? No, no, we, okay. we apply. So when we're applying, we're we're not really applying to the state. We get money passed down based on census information to okay. our building. What we do in our grant application is we're getting the award. We just have to justify in our application how we spend the award. Okay. Because there are federal compliance features that the state, that the DOE is responsible for ensuring that we stay in line. Okay. But it is a federal overarch. Okay. So that's totally separate. This is state aid, totally different. Totally. totally. Yeah. So that's that's in the state's operating state. budget. Yes. And do you know kind of roughly, I guess, yes. how much? We always anticipate about 80 to 85 percent. Although I haven't seen a year where we're drastically over or above what we get the previous year. This year we took a little bit of a hit on Title One. Um, I, I hate to say it. It depends on who's in office, like where the themes are, like federally. Okay. because this is a federal pot of money. So at one time they talked about cutting Title II and that never happened and then Title I shifted down a little bit this year but that just could be because the census data was just renewed. Okay. So oh, yeah. okay. I was in Monmouth Beach last year yeah. as an example of how the census data impacts. So Monmouth Beach, very affluent district. I was getting Title I money and I'm like, how is this even possible? I don't have any frame just lunch kids, period. It was based on federal census data from Sandy. Oh, wow. Yeah, so they yeah. had people okay. declaring homelessness. Okay. So, and FEMA records. So, I was getting this pile of money, and I was like, just without having any low income families. Fast forward to last year, I got a notice that I was ineligible because it's a new census. Yeah, okay. So, and that the census is obviously a 10 year process. So, you know, it won't change now pretty much. Yeah. It might shift teeny percentages, but mm, the broader buckets will remain what they are for right. probably the next 10 years, unless something drastic happens in the government. So, question, does special end numbers or costs influence the federal funding at all, or is it completely no, outside? No, it's completely outside. That's the IDEA yeah. yeah. grant, which is also federal, but that has, that's not in this okay. kind I just of wanted to make sure that There are a whole set of different rules for that. <laughs> <laughs> Title II is, um, there's, there's a couple of 
different ways that we can spend that money and the purposes. So we can spend it, it's, the idea is to increase student achievement. Um, we can do that by um, training our staff. We can do that by increasing, um, increasing our staff in an effort to decrease our class sizes. Right, so by, uh, we can make the argument that we are um, having more kids in touch with um, higher quality teachers. So one of the biggest ways that we do spend this money um, was funding teaching salaries through class size reduction. Again, was the, the biggest identified need, um, and that is exactly how we're spending um, a large portion of this uh, grant fund. Um, then there's professional learning opportunities. So you'll see that it's broken down into language arts, small group, um, and then uh, it left off part of that. Um, and then training to offer training in using data to drive instruction. So it's primarily class size reduction. And then after that, it's all different ways that we do professional development. So and that's it's exactly how we are using these funds. So I'm sorry, what's Title II again? Like which, is that school specific? No. So Title II is, yep. Just okay. across the board, so we can designate where that goes. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. It's district wide, so it, it funds a lot of our or some of our professional development throughout the district. Um, we can use it to bring in outside presenters. And just so you're aware, anytime you pay for a salary with a portion of Title One, we are or any of the titles rather, we're obligated to pick up a portion of the a piece of the benefits. So when you look at it's not just salary, yeah. we have to factor in salary plus a portion of the benefits package. So that $136,000, when you talk about salary and benefits, doesn't go very far. Um, you spend it really, it's yeah. one teacher. Um, yeah. And you also, the requirement is it has to be a K to three teacher. And it has to be where your class size is like, pretty much bumping up against your max. Okay, so if you have like a 24 and a 25, or you have a 25, you know, or a 28, you might want to split that into two put a class size reduction teacher in a high needs building. Right now our class size reduction teacher is at New Mama. That's where we situate the salary. But it can't and it can't be the same teacher two years in a row. But <laughs> um, that's okay. Bigger school is okay. We have we have lots of options. Yeah. Um, we just look to aim where the class size is the highest. Yeah. You know and like I said, keep in mind when we put this in, we don't put the teacher's name in. It's a shell game. But we have to approve the funding on a board agenda. So if they really wanted us that deeply, they could come back and look to see, like, did you fund the same person twice in a row? But for the actual application, we don't put in specific names tied to those monies. But we have to sign a set of assurances when we submit the grant. And do you have, like, tracking information on how the class sizes are changing in each building based on this? Yeah, yep. Yeah, lots of spreadsheets ways. about class size oh, yeah. all the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you know what, it's, it's sometimes we make a shift at the last minute because enrollments, yeah, you know, changes. enrollment happens late into the summer and um, we, you know, we try to use it in a way very strategically to ensure that we're using it for the purpose that the grant is, you know, outlining that it has to be used. Three monies are appropriated for English language learners and immigrant students. So we use those uh, those funds for. You'll see this is nowhere near a salary. So now we're talking about instructional supplies for our ELL students, um, professional development for staff who work with our ELL students. Um, so that includes both our specifically our ELL or our ESL teachers and also our teachers throughout the district who work with students in their general ed classrooms who are not certified as ELL teachers but are working with our ELL population. Um, and then also some of our parent outreach also comes out of there. Um, so it's a, lot of, it's a lot of books, um, some software that they're using, um, and like I said, some of that is professional development, which is what we offered in the beginning of this year. So Title III, I guess I should mention, um, 
what made me think of it. Title IV is also a throughout the district grant funding opportunity. Um, Title IV is in place to make sure that we are able to provide students um, with a well-rounded education. So it kind of gives us some interesting leeway in how we can spend the money there. Um, so they, this one specifically mentions technology. Um, it specifically mentions well-rounded and what we've been able to do with that is, um, and I um, can't think of the words, but what we use it for is some of our social, emotional, or mental wellness um, initiatives. So this year we're using it for some of our restorative practices that we're doing at the high schools specifically. Um, we do have restorative practices going on in more buildings, but this was targeted for the high schools. Um, some of the classes that our students are taking when they take online classes um, are gifted and talented supplies can come out of that as that well-rounded education portion um, and advanced opportunities. Similar to that, we use it for some of our middle school elective class supplies uh, because those are also going towards that well-rounded education and cross-curricular opportunities. Um, and then for the PD portion, we have been designating it to, or at the, the technology end, we've been using it on the PD end um, to support use of digital tools and then also for hotspots for internet. It's a very small portion, but it's, it's this weird thing where we have to spend a certain amount of money in technology. Um, they're very restrictive <laughs> on how we can spend it. So that was the way that we were able to make that work. Um, so again, to kind of show you where that needs assessment was, programs and activities across multiple disciplines was first and foremost. Um, we've already talked at length about how we are supporting um, mental health services throughout our district. So we obviously identify that as a need and are funding it where we can. Um, and then our technology and capacity infrastructure um, is also in there. So that's what we've been doing with our Title IV monies. There is one more other title that I just want to touch upon. We did not receive funding this year, Title V, which is Perkins Grant, and that has to do with career and technical education. So we um, put in our first CTE pathway this year. It's a business pathway. Um, it's a four course sequence, and the requirement is that the course builds upon one another. So like in order for kids to take the second course, they need to have taken the first. So then you need to have a common thread winding through all four courses. Um, once you have that established CTE and you have a student group that's rostered for a year, you're eligible to apply for Perkins grant money. So you have to set your program and have a designated roster of students before you can apply. So this year, we broke the coursework, we rostered the kids, and this year, in the spring, we'll apply for funding, which will help sustain and grow that program over time. The next pathway we're looking to potentially investigate is a culinary pathway. Um, we want to try to look towards areas that are not um, so academically driven in nature to try to reach you know, a larger <coughs> breadth of um, careers for our kids. And we know that culinary is an area where we have a lot of student interest already. Those classes are packed every year. Um, so if we can expose students to more of that is kind of the, yeah. the path that we're looking to take. And equipment, right? Like, so we do have, you know, um, classes where they do have kitchens and such now where, you know, if, if we went the line of like, we saw some great things, like we went and visited schools that have automotive shops, construction rooms, but right now, like that's not a viable thing for us, but we're gonna look to offsite for other opportunities to partner with people to maybe grow that. But so we're gonna start where we think we can also support it through our facilities, you know? And have a high, high degree of interest. So that's Title V. We don't receive, which is why it's not part of this, but I thought I'd mention it as um, it's part of PAC in the sense of like once we receive, then that becomes part, this group becomes part of that stakeholder group that continues to drive decisions forward with how we use that money. Yeah. I remember them reviewing that last year, like the yes. visits and stuff, it was super cool. I'm just curious, the four courses that the kids have to take, are they year-long courses? So does it have to be freshman, sophomore, junior, senior? No, they're semester. Okay, so you can do like junior and senior year, you could... We had kids this year that were in the business pathway, wanted to do this, and took <coughs> four courses. Okay. Because it's they took two on the, because they had enough room in their schedule. Yeah, they took, they took two on the front end, and then they took two on the back end. The back end, the last one is an internship. 
okay. experience. Um, it's, we call it a capstone. Okay. Because it doesn't necessarily, by federal code, have to be like an out of district thing. Although we encourage kids to get a true internship, um, but the thread through that we created in these business classes, because we use the core of some of the business classes we already had, because we have a strong business pathway. How we tied them together is we had all through, all through the four courses, kids were coming up with a business plan for a business that they wanted to, you know, operate in the end. But in each piece of the course, they were learning components of that. So it was a four course project, yeah. so to speak. Okay. But they Over. came out with like something tangible at the end. So the shortest amount would be then two years? They we had did it in one, but two okay. is better. I mean, the kids that are doing it in one year, I think there's a, actually probably not all four, three out of the four they would have had to have taken because they took the okay. intern business, yeah. but it's still a lift. I mean, yeah. but the next year, and now that we have it up and running, It'll be um, even easier. The issue is too that we selected a pathway or a CTE pathway that we already had a typical pathway for. Yeah. So kids were kind of all over the place and where what they took because the pathway sequence we have is not the same as what the CTE pathway was going to be. So it was a little disjointed. Most CTE programs are built from the ground up where you create your course sequence and then you invite your freshmen okay. to become a part of the, the initial coursework or maybe your freshmen and sophomores so that they, they have a long time in their high school careers to take all four courses in that sequence and they haven't already taken something that looks like it, which is what was happening with business. But we were going to have one kind of bumpy year because of that, regardless of what we put in. So how many kids are in it now? Um, just curious. I, don't, like, where do I they would fall? say probably 20 kids between the two high schools, which is a good start. Um, are we have a couple of courses that um, like the internship in particular is being um, done between like, at the same time with both high schools because it's more of like a consultative thing we do it like virtual kind of thing the other piece is that in order to teach some of these business courses you need to have a master's in business so we have limited staff to be able to do that so it, it's been a little bit of a um, you know a, trying to figure out the dynamics of what it looks like, but 20 kids is a good start. Yeah. So like eighth graders this year, when they're doing their course selections for next year, in May or April, or it's actually earlier, I think. Right, okay. this will be Staff. part of what they could potentially yeah. engage in. Okay. Yeah. And you come out on your transcript with like an endorsement that you completed a CTE pathway. Yeah. Like it's nice, it's a nice little caveat. What we want to do, the spirit and intention of CTE is to really um, create some pathways that are not um, in the typical academic track. So that's where we're going to kind of, business was a good first step because we had existing things we could kind of springboard from. But I would like to see us take a more um, career vocational path with some of these things to provide some alternate opportunities for kids that might not be going on to post-secondary education in a traditional sense. Um, you know, we have our vote program, which, which is well attended. Um, you know, but it's good to have things in the house that we can keep our kids, you know, for the full day and they can get um, some other exposures.
through us. We're the local education agency because we encumber them in our geographic boundary. It's like the busing. Yeah. It's, it's, it's similar-ish. It's a little bit of a headache, but you know, um, because what ends up happening is <coughs> non-public schools, whether they're cat, like part of the diocese or otherwise, just true private schools, um, they often are well-versed in federal laws. They kind of do what they want. <laughs> Um, so it's really hard to manage it, but we are responsible for all their spending and approving their spending and the oversight of it. So part of that needs assessment and part of that initial planning for spending includes consultation with them as well. So those dollar figures that were at the top of each, you know, Title One, Title Two bucket, that's I gave you just, just hours. Okay, so I took hours of the non-public. No, no, no. What yeah. just out of curiosity, like, what's the full Title One bucket, including all of the? Other ones, like is it a, is it double? They don't get Title, title one. one. They don't get. Oh, they don't get. Okay. No. Okay. No. So how you figure out non-public Title One? Ready for this one? Because this is <laughs> another nightmare. So you have to determine who goes to one of these privates in your geographic boundaries, and then determine who's free to reduce much from them, which is you're relying on the non-public to get that information, which they're terrible at. And then you have to figure out how many kids would have attended your Title I center and then figure out the per pupil allocation and give them that piece of money. So what ends up happening is the Title I's just decline, the non-publics decline because they don't want to go they through the process. It's a lot of research for them. Yeah. It's a waste it's of their working. time. Like so it, it's like a yeah. like a major math problem. And also trying to figure out based on very little data who goes to a non-public that would have come here and where do they live and would they have gone to somebody that's a uh, Title I school here. here? Oh, it's like, so um, typically, uh, normally what ends up happening is it's like St. Mary's might have a kid, Modern Day used to have a kid, those used to be our only two. Um, and then St. Mary's just started declining because it was just too hard for them to acquire free and reduced lunch information. So they just say, you know, we don't have any. They just say no. <laughs> Yeah, they'll, they'll apply for Title II and Title IV. And you can decline, I mean, you can decline federal money. You have, there's a place in the application where you can say, like, no, thank you, because they don't want to be tied to the compliance issue. You know. Last year in Mountain Beach, I got $53 for Title III. I declined. I'm like, what am I doing for $53? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, is that, like, an arm of a kid? I, like, 53 it was just a random number. And I was like, I, it's more work for, because if you are under, Ten thousand dollars in Title Three money. You have to join a consortium for spending. So you can't even like just. I couldn't have just bought something for fifty three dollars. I had to like join up with like a group. Team up. I was like, forget it. Yeah, for decline. <laughs> so, but federal money. There's so many rules, and but it's important because you can get audited. I mean, we were audited here probably ten years ago. Um, and they come in and they really take a look at you know your accountability measures. But um, we've been good since then. So in aggregate, annually, how I didn't add up because I was going along. What it's like under a million dollars. What we oh have. yeah, okay. yeah. It's so yeah, it's probably about uh, six six hundred fifty thousand dollars because Title One was like three eighty nine, then you got okay, the one sixty, yeah. and then you got the ten or fourteen or so, and then you got the four, maybe seven at the most. <coughs> and it hovers around there, you know, routinely. And our Title One, it, the majority of that 359 is salaries and benefits. Um, you know. And how much in state did we get? It was like, we like know, 18 to 12 ish? No? Yeah. It, I mean, it's a bigger yeah. chunk of our. Oh, yeah, and that's just, that's different because that comes out of the state's operating budget. Okay.
viability of the courses. We have to make sure that we have staff. We have to make sure that we have functioning facilities for that. Um, right now, we're in the preliminary investigative stages. But what I'm hoping is, is we apply for Perkins money, get Perkins money, and then start to turn it over into I being see. able to do some of the stuff. Okay. So I don't think next year. I think the following year is probably more viable because we need that money pot to get this rolling more. Yeah. When's Wits? It'll be still at Wits, right? For lunch stuff? Are they yeah. up soon? Like maybe you could be part of the new contract? Yeah, I'm thinking and, like they would be great for an internship. Yeah, or just even facilities and training. Yeah. Maybe it's part of what we yeah. demand from whoever It's the most the viable, in my opinion, yeah. for something different, well, like high interest for our kids. Yeah. And also something that, um, you know, we can support. Yeah. No, it seems like a great, I think you will have a ton of interest in yeah. that. Yeah. Awesome. The CTE programs in general are great to be in two to three years. Okay. Sequence. It's not Two. really. I. It's not really ideal to have freshmen involved yeah. for most of them anyway. Let freshmen be freshmen, yeah. and then uh, let them start to focus after that. Um, so yeah, we're certainly not missing out on the um, current eighth graders. If we can get it into place, it would be more of a start of your sophomore year.